Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Regime of Digital video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which Angie Jean has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Intel, as the company ramps up production of Coffee Lake processors. This is in an effort, of course, to keep up with demand. And then in another piece of Intel news, they are removing legacy BIOS support for motherboards in, by 2020. And finally, something in the memory space. Intel may have Optane, but Samsung has Z NAND, which looks to perform very similarly to X-Point, but does have the potential to scale better in terms of capacity. But first things first, as I said, and that is Intel's assembly and test factory ramp up for Coffee Lake. So Intel released the 8700K, 8700, 8600K, 8400, and other products back in early October. The problem is that supply simply did not meet demand, especially in certain regions. I've actually heard Australia got particularly hit hard by this. Regardless, the fact of the matter is, because the um, chips were in short supply, retailers did the inevitable. They ramped up prices. Currently, most of the assembly and testing is done in Malaysia, but because these processes are very popular and the fact that production of these chips is quite tricky, Intel have decided to also farm out another manufacturing facility which is located in China. Now don't forget that Intel have been utilizing the 14nm fabrication process for about three years. And so now they've moved over to 14 um, plus plus technology. And unfortunately, Intel have not released the figures of what they are producing at this particular facility in Malaysia. And of course, subsequently, how, man how many ships it's expected to be producing in China. But the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is if you are considering buying, let's say, an 8600K processor and you're umming and ahhing because it doesn't quite uh, meet the MSRP at the moment. As I said, prices are somewhat inflated, particularly in partic uh, certain regions. Although, as usual, stock and pricing go up and down like the yo-yo. It may be worth you waiting for about a month, as by the 15th of December, these processes will start to be produced in China. So what you could possibly do is either buy yourself a new system for Christmas, or perhaps wait for January sales and maybe you can snag yourself a bargain. Or more realistically, you can just buy one at Christmas, let's just be honest. Finally, Intel um, are also upsetting customers. And by finally, I mean the final piece of Intel-related news. They are going the last mile for them, but not quite in the direction that you'd expect. Because they are removing legacy BIOS support by Motherboards UFE by the year 2020. So this actually popped up uh, originally in a, a PDF that's floating around. You can download it from ufe.org. I'll place a link, of course, in the video description if you so desire to check it out. Um, it's quite a lengthy read, so I'm certainly not going to be going through the entire thing. Essentially, Intel are pushing the advantages of UFE Class 3. And there are numerous benefits to it. For one, it reduces the size of microcode. For two, it increases security. Although Intel and security, when we all know about a slight issue with Intel processors, which will remain nameless in this video. <coughs> Cough Intel management engine. Intel actually specify that smaller code size, smaller validation footprint, the encouragement of usage of new technologies, and the fact that the industry as a whole is certainly starting to move towards it. And as I mentioned, security is also another thing that they are considering as well. But there are some issues, as there tends to be. And whether these issues affect you or not is, well, dependent on your usage scenario, as it tends to be. Business orientated folks, in fact, have had a couple of people messaging me. I was actually speaking to a viewer today about this, Joe, who I regularly contact via email. Uh, I actually have quite a few people who I regularly go backwards and forwards with via Facebook or email, as a slight aside. Um, he mentioned, because he uh, does server management work, I don't want to tell too much about his business, but um, he does a lot of server management and that type of work, and he's already mentioned that a couple of clients have been a bit concerned about this, and I suspect this is going to be an issue for many, because there are a couple of things that will impact. Now, this will mean it lacks uh, future BIOSes when this 
uh, change takes effect, it will lack CSM, which is Compatibility Support Module. Now, the entire breadth of this is well outside the remit of a news video, but what it does do essentially is say, nope, no more 32-bit operating systems on these particular machines. So this means that Linux as well as Windows will no longer really be able to function. Uh, so you can, of course, still run 32-bit software. So for the sake of argument, let's say you have a game which is a 32-bit XE, which, let's face it, is pretty much most of them, especially up until a year or two ago, um, because, well, you know, games just didn't really need to address even more than 4 gigabytes of RAM. As a slight aside, if you actually look at uh, Skyrim and how much memory it could address on launch, it was actually really titchy. I think it was like 2 gigabytes, don't quote me on that, but there was actually a fan made patch to allow it to even access 4, because... Uh, Bethesda at the time just didn't think it was going to be, you know, required. And obviously, when fans started to mod the game, it caused it to conk, pretty much. Anywho, um, so with 32-bit operating systems, you're going to go by the wayside. I'll admit, for the most part, if you're a gamer, if you're a content creator, if you're and by content creator, I mean whether you're, you know, a video editor, um, 3D, you know, 3D artist, whether you're even a YouTube creator that's probably not going to impact you because most of the time you're going to want a 64-bit operating system because let's really be honest here, you want to have as much RAM as possible, you know, and you're not going to be thinking, oh gee, I really want to use like, you know, Windows 7, um, you know, 32-bit or Windows XP 32-bit unless you're doing it for dual boot purposes, which is one area that gamers might want 32-bit. Uh, operating systems. For example, let's say that you've got Windows uh, XP boot, um, sorry, a boot partition. So what you can do, of course, is still run virtual machines, and that should be okay. And while 64 translation layers uh, through Windows 64 should also work as well, there is another small problem, and that is 16-bit op ROMs. So what do they do? Well, this is going to be things such as network adapters and older RAIDs. But in theory, uh, assuming the drivers and software support is available, you should be able to use your operating system to configure these devices. The other issue is that old graphics cards will, in theory at least, no longer work. Uh, this is assuming that they're released, like, let's say, 2013, and certainly 2012 or prior. So what does that mean? Well, if you are wanting to use an older graphics card for the sake of argument, for, let's say, streaming purposes like putting together a low-power streaming uh, uh, computer or, for example, once again, a legacy gaming rig, that type of thing, then you could have some problems. But, generally speaking, I think for the most part, a lot of individuals are not going to be impacted by this. Instead, I suspect it's going to be more corporations who perhaps uh, have a part that perhaps goes perf, goes bang, and... What they need to do is they need to install that because some, you know, some corporations, some businesses, they're using software, they're using, you know, databases or whatever that is really old. I was actually talking to a couple of people uh, on Facebook. Anyways, these are viewers once again. I'm not going to mention names. And I was saying that one of the tasks I've actually been doing in real, you know, you know, for my work basically, in real life, if you will, has actually been migrating. I I've you know, finished now. Was well, actually migrating a client from uh, what was it? Access database and um, some old ass version of SQL. I don't even remember the, how old it was. I think it was like two thousand and maybe two thousand and three, two thousand and five, something like that. I don't remember exactly, but basically it was way back in the day, and I actually migrated it to um, a modern day versions and also online as well so now he's got it um the business rather has got it so that you know they can access it anywhere in the world and it's more secure and it's all done via microsoft uh you know cloud-based solutions as well basically and you know it just works a lot better and all the bugs are now removed and it's just more stable and modern operating systems but a lot of clients don't have that luxury because you know it would require an awful lot of cash or an awful lot of downtime or migration time for them to move some databases, legacy databases, and a lot of the time they're essentially being held together with 
of uh, duct tape and prayers, <laughs> as a lot of system admins will be able to tell you. So in those cases, I do find um, I will find it interesting to see how the how the business how how businesses rather manage to uh, deal with that. Finally, uh, on the subject of Intel, but from a very different competitive standpoint, and that is Z Z, however you want to pronounce it, NAND. This is being touted as an X point killer, although to be fair, I wouldn't really classify it as a killer, more of a competitor. So Z NAND is Samsung's tweaked flash technology, and in a nutshell, should compete rather well. So one of the premium drives, of course, using Optane is the P4800X. <laughs> Comparing it to Samsung's power, uh, Z NAND powered uh, two, uh, sorry, SZ985, both of these, of course, are anon card formats and have similar capacities and capabilities, but there are some things that Optane does better and some things that NAND does better. Capacity-wise, they're almost identical. You've got 750 gigabytes versus 800 gigabytes, so in favor here of the Z, Z NAND. However, when it comes to the um, actual uh, performance figures, they either are very much competitive or one uh, ruffle stomps the other one. So we'll start out with random read and uh, random read latency, excuse me, and they're basically identical. However, random read slash write IOPS definitely Intel Optane has a major advantage. You have 750,000 for read compared to 550,000 on Optane. So here, of course, ZNAN does definitely have a small advantage. And I say small because that just gets completely nullified by write, which is 170 versus 500,000 IOPS. And according to the figures, though, sequential read and write, Samsung do have the advantage 3.2 slash 3.2 compared to 2.4 slash 2. So what does all of this mean? It means competition. Uh, as usual, certain drives are just better at certain tasks. So, for example, if you're doing a lot of uh, writing to the drive, then obviously you might be better off with Optane. On the other hand, if you need to do an awful lot of reading from the drive, so perhaps actually Samsung's drive might be better for gamers for the sake of argument, or for folks who do just you know need to pull off a lot of data really fast, then most likely ZNAND will come into its own. Obviously, we'll have to wait to see what pricing and all that type of stuff actually does. And of course, perhaps the most important thing of all, real-world performance, because it's all well and great to say, hey, look at these, you know, theoretical performance numbers, but they don't necessarily equate to real-world performance. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.